I guess you can actually talk in chat. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Matthew Cabrero, and I'm here with Joseph Savoso. We're both attorneys with Michelle and Associates in Long Beach, California. For those of you that don't know who we are, we represent the National Rifle Association and the California Rifle and Pistol Association. And of course, our boss, Chuck Michelle, is the president of the California Rifle and Pistol Association and has been working on firearm-related issues for decades. Today, we're going to be talking about the recently approved Office, uh, De Department of Justice uh, regulations regarding the registration of newly classified assault weapons. And we're going to be talking about the requirements for registration, the recent history of the assault weapon regulations, what firearms need to be registered, the process for registering those firearms, and some additional laws that will soon be taking effect. So before we get started, of course, our typical disclaimer that this webinar is provided for education and informational purposes only. It does not establish an attorney-client relationship. We do not make any guarantees or other promises as to the accuracy or completeness of the information in this webinar. We do our best, and it is provided as is. If you do have questions after the webinar or during the webinar, of course, Joe mentioned already that uh, you can ask them in the live chat if that's available to you. We'll do our best to answer them as we go forward. Otherwise, you can send questions to contact at crpa.org after the webinar is over, and of course, we'll do our best to answer those questions as well. Yeah, I'm so looking what over is the chat right now, guys. Sorry, Matt. Um, yeah. You guys are asking a lot of questions. A lot of this will be covered, so don't worry about it. But um, I've got three pages of notes of questions, and I'm not a quarter of the way through. So while Matt's talking, I'll do my best to put down your questions and see if I can address those while I'm speaking. Matt will do the same while I'm speaking and either jump in or at the end of this try to address as many of those questions as we've seen. But um, we're pushing 1,500 people again for something like this. And uh, sorry, guys, we're not going to be able to get to all y'all's questions. So uh, sorry, Matt, for the interruption. But I'll keep on looking at the questions in the chat to try to address as many of those as I can when I'm speaking um, after Matt. Take it away, Matt. Yeah. So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the California Rifle and Pistol Association, it is the official state association of the National Rifle Association. Of course, if you want to learn more about it, you can go to www.crpa.org. Of course, they're always looking for volunteers, so if, you have any, if you're interested in being a volunteer, you can send an email to volunteer at crpa.org. And of course, if you have any general comments or questions, send it to contact at crpa.org. Uh, for those of you that don't know, obviously with these uh, regulations as well as the recently enacted laws, our office on behalf of the NRA and CRPA are currently preparing a number of legal challenges to those laws. Some of those have already been filed, including RUP v. Becerra, which challenges the California assault weapon restrictions as a whole on Second Amendment grounds, as well as Duncan v. Becerra, which challenges California's recently enacted prohibition on the possession of magazines capable of holding more than 10 rounds, as well as the general restrictions for such magazines, which of course resulted in a, in a very monumental injunction recently, which prohibited the enforcement of Proposition 63 regarding those magazines. Uh, so those lawsuits have already been filed, but we do have other lawsuits that are currently in the works, and of course you can be a part of it by, being a, by serving as a plaintiff. So if you or someone you know is interested in being a plaintiff in a lawsuit like that, please send an email to potentialplaintiffs at michellelawyers.com. Uh, don't hesitate in reaching out. Uh, even if you have questions, uh, you know, you're, of course, it's always helpful to have individuals who are willing to serve and participate as plaintiffs. And of course, we're happy to address any questions that you might have. Moving forward, of course, uh, the NRA uh, ILA has uh, now a dedicated web page specifically to California-related firearms issues. With the website there, you can see you can go take a look at it if you get the opportunity to. That includes action alerts, legal updates, pending legislation, and volunteer opportunities here specific to California. So I encourage you, if you have not seen that web page already, please go ahead and take a look at it. Uh, in addition to that, the NRA and CRPA, we now put out a sort of bi-monthly report on all litigation, local ordinance efforts, regulatory matters, hunting matters, and range efforts here specifically in California. Uh, you'll see that as has been and always will be the case, NRA and CRPA invest enormous amounts of resources into these efforts. A lot of people don't necessarily see that it's NRA and CRPA that's you know, behind that, and so we want to try and get that information out to people as much as possible and sort of show that the, sort of the enormous amount of work that goes into defending the right to keep and bear arms here in California. The digital version of this report is available on the NRA ILA webpage, specific to California, the Stand and Fight webpage, as well as the CRPA's webpage. 
please, if you can, take take a look at it. It'll you'll sort of be very surprised to see how much goes on here in California. Uh, moving forward, uh, this is something that you'll be seeing shortly. Uh, our office, on behalf of the NRA and CRPA, has put together this sort of assault weapon cheat sheet. I know it's difficult to read, but that just sort of shows you what it's going to look like. Uh, in addition to this page, on the second page, there is a helpful flow chart that will help individuals identify whether their firearms are subject to the new law and, as a result, are required to be registered. That will be available on the CRPA's website at that link that you see there. Uh, my understanding is that should be up later today, if not already, but uh, it's, it should be up very shortly here. So of course, for some additional information, always check out the CRPA's website, uh, and be sure to subscribe to NRA and CRPA email alerts. You can do that both on NRA ILA's Stand and Fight California webpage and the CRPA's website, and that will help you keep informed on any sort of changes or updates regarding these regulations and future California firearm-related issues. So let's get to it. So if you, of course, already know, in July of last year, Senate Bill and Senate Bill 880 and Assembly Bill 1135 were signed into law, both of which redefined the definition of an assault weapon under California law as applied to certain rifles and pistols only. This law has been in effect since January 1, 2017, and it has the following changes there regarding certain rifles and pistols. The big change being that a semi-automatic centerfire rifle that has the capacity to accept a detachable magazine now reads a semi-automatic centerfire rifle that does not have a fixed magazine but has any one of the following prohibited features, which you see listed there. And sort of the same thing for pistols, semi-automatic pistols that do not have a fixed magazine but have any one of the following prohibited features listed there. It is important to note that Senate Bill 880 and AB 1135 didn't change a lot of the definitions under California law for what's considered an assault weapon. This includes the make model list, which has been in effect since 1990, semi-automatic centerfire rifles that have a fixed magazine with the capacity to accept more than 10 rounds, semi-automatic centerfire rifles with an overall length of less than 30 inches, semi-automatic pistols with a fixed magazine that have the capacity to accept more than 10 rounds, certain semi-automatic shotguns that have certain prohibited features that are listed there, shotguns with revolving cylinders, and of course, semi-automatic shotguns able to accept a detachable magazine. Now, that is highlighted in red because the Department of Justice has taken the position that those shotguns are actually affected by this legislation, even though the legislation itself did not include it. Joe will be talking about that in a little bit more detail here later. So, currently owned firearms that are to be registered. So Senate Bill 880 and, 11, and AB 1135 also require those firearms that are now classified as assault weapons to be registered as follows. The key thing here to remember is that you must have lawfully possessed it prior to January 1st of this year, and that you have until July 1st, 2018. It was previously January 1st next year. Now it's July 1st, according to an, a new assembly bill that was recently enacted that requires you to register it before then. And the department, of course, is required to adopt regulations for the purposes of implementing this registration process, which is what we're here to talk about today. So as I mentioned, the Senate bills, Senate Bill 880 and 11, AB 1135 require certain firearms, now classified as assault weapons, to be registered. To facilitate this, they also require the DOJ to draft and enact regulations to that effect. DOJ first proposed those regulations just before New Year's Eve last year, but of course, instead of attempting to implement only those regulations necessary, they went far and beyond their legislative mandate. Their first attempt at these regulations included over 40 new definitions, excessive personal information requirements, requirements for the serialization of home-built firearms as a condition of registration, expansion of the assault weapon definition to certain shotguns, as I mentioned, which Joe will talk about in a little bit, and a prohibition against altering firearm magazine release mechanisms once they are registered. They also refuse to publicly release the text of these regulations in an attempt to get them to be filed in print only, meaning that they wouldn't allow public comment on the regulations, which is typical for California rulemaking pr procedures. Of course, our office, on behalf of the NRA and CRPA, responded by submitting a joint opposition letter to the Office of Administrative Law and a pre-litigation demand letter to the Department of Justice for the withdrawal of the proposal. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the Office of Administrative Law, that is the state agency that oversees the regulatory rulemaking process here in California. And of course, 
Following those letters being submitted, DOJ voluntarily withdrew its proposed regulations the day before the Office of Administrative Law was set to make a decision. And then we followed up with the public records request, and it was later discovered that the Office of Administrative Law was planning to deny DOJ's first attempt at those regulations. But of course, this didn't stop DOJ, who very shortly later resubmitted its proposed regulations on May 15th without any substantive changes whatsoever. In addition to these regulations, however, this time they included a cover letter that attempted to counter the arguments that we raised in our opposition letter. Uh, and including this kind of suggested that the Office of Administrative Law was planning on denying DOJ's first attempt because of the opposition letter that NRA and CRPA sent in opposition to those proposed regulations. So, of course, in response to this, our office, again, on behalf of the NRA and CRPA, prepared a second comprehens comprehensive opposition letter that point by point dismantled DOJ's arguments, highlighted in detail how the proposal was unnecessary and lacked appropriate legislative authority and was otherwise vague and unenforceable. And, of course, the Office of Administrative Law formally denied DOJ's request to, to file and print those regulations. Again, however, this didn't stop DOJ, who very shortly later submitted a third attempt, which is where we are now, of their proposed regulations, which again were substantively unchanged from the previous versions. So unlike DOJ's second attempt, however, there was no cover letter or explanation for the resubmission. And as you all know, OAL approved the regulations nearly a month before its own deadline to make a decision. There are, of course, theories as to why that happened, but for now it's just mere speculation. But as I said, our office is currently preparing litigation to challenge these regulations. And so if you're interested in being a plaintiff in that lawsuit, please send an email to potentialplaintiffs at michellelawyers.com, and we can go from there. So now that those regulations have been enacted, the Department of Justice's website for the registration of certain firearms now classified as assault weapons is now active. And as if some of you may notice, in attempting to register it recently, that website promptly crashed, along with all of the other systems, including the Attorney General's website, the Fish and Wildlife website, and the Dros Electronic System, and the FSC system. Go figure. If you are going to be in real quick right there, I yeah. think you might have covered it, but there was a question in uh, in passing in relation to why OAL, after this third time around, actually accepted the regulations. Quite frankly, we don't know, but it is something we're going to get to the bottom of because it's a little odd that now this third time around, with very minor changes to the regulations, OAL decided to accept them and accept them far earlier then they're allotted time to do so. And so it is something our office is looking into. Um, we will let everybody know uh, once and if we are able to get to the bottom of that. Yeah. Sorry, Matt. So, Go ahead. No, okay. So um, now that the registration website is active, this is something that we're going to be covering in more detail here, but we want to make sure that everyone is aware of this, that early reports regarding people attempting to register their firearms as assault weapons suggest that the system is allowing to people to submit registrations for firearms that were previously classified as assault weapons or are otherwise prohibited. So if you attempt to register a firearm that's technically illegal for you to possess even before this law was passed, the system is going to allow you to attempt to register it, and that will essentially notify DOJ that you're in possession of an illegal assault weapon. So you want to make sure that if you're going to be registering a firearm, that it's not a firearm that is actually prohibited prior, under prior laws. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, like I said. You don't, you don't want to attempt to register those firearms because that could, could cause you serious problems down the road. So if you are going to register a firearm, the requirements are generally that, like I said, you possess the firearm prior to January 1, 2017. You were eligible to register it and that you lawfully possess the assault weapon prior to January 1st, as I said. Uh, the, you must also complete the registration now uh, by July 1st, 2018, which was previously January 1st, 2018, in accordance with the requirements of the Penal Code. There are, Correct. however, of course... To that, and to clarify that last slide, they did change the law recently to July 1st of 2018. And so what the law previously said there... and um, the 
the slimy highlight is telling to us um, yeah. that that was a, a law that was changed just within the last month by Governor Brown as part of a huge budget bill. Um, but they wedged in some assault weapon language into that, also expanded the definition of prohibited persons, uh, but nevertheless pushed the deadline back to July 1st of 2018, no doubt having to do in part of DOJ's inability to get reg regulations in place and a registration process into place until now we're into August, uh, and to give DOJ more time and for people to follow the registration procedures. Yep. So... Uh, just be aware, like this, like Joe mentioned, that, that that date that's highlighted there, it's now technically July 1st of next year, not January 1st is when you have until registering. Um, moving forward, there are, of course, alternatives that you have as opposed to registering a firearm. Uh, these are the, the four main options are the modification of the firearm, which can generally be accomplished in one of two ways, either by removing the prohibited features or by making the firearm California compliant. Uh, so by making it California compliant, what we mean is either making it non-semi-automatic, non-center fire, or making sure that it has a fixed magazine. You can also disassemble the firearm, preventing the firearm from functioning even by removing the upper receiver should take the firearm out from under the assault weapon definition. But of course, once you disassemble it, it cannot legally be reassembled into assault weapon under in, in, its, in its configuration here in California. You can also sell or surrender the firearm if you choose to do so. Generally, you can only be sold. You can only sell the firearm in California to a person with a dangerous weapons permit. That's very important. And then finally, removal from the state. And that's, and that's essentially once you remove the firearm from California in its assault weapons configuration, it cannot legally be brought back in that same configuration in the state of California. Now, with this said, there is of course enough. Yeah, yeah, and so sorry to jump in yet again, Matt. But in the area of clarification, though, both for the surrender and sale and the removal from state, keep in mind also that if you take your firearm outside the great state of California in order to transfer it, federal laws will apply as will state laws. Typically when you're selling your firearm to somebody else outside of your state of residence to a resident in another state, you will need to go through a licensed firearm dealer in that recipient's home state. So if you're planning on taking the firearm outside the state, selling it there to somebody else or a dealer there, you will need to go through a dealer in the recipient's home state. You just can't literally give somebody a firearm outside the state of California because the federal law doesn't like two people from different states giving or selling each other firearms. A federal firearms licensee needs to be the middleman to conduct the transfer in the recipient's home state. Sorry, Matt, for jumping in there, but I thought that clarification needed to be made. Yeah, so, um, and just so you guys know, too, I know there's going to be a lot of questions today about, for example, what can you do to firearms to modify it so that it's no longer considered an assault weapon under the new law. Our office will be putting out another follow-up webinar to this, uh, regarding how you can go about making a firearm quote-unquote featureless or California compliant, and we will try and address all of the uh, aftermarket modifications that are out there and available to you in that webinar. Uh, I am seeing some questions regarding uh, what is a dangerous weapons permit. Uh, generally speaking, that's not something that's easily obtainable uh, here in California by an individual that, that's very specific, for example, sales of assault weapons to law enforcement, or if you're involved in the entertainment industry, that's generally not something that you as an individual can obtain. Uh, but just so be aware that if you are trying to sell or sell your firearm here in California, that because it's an assault weapon, the sale of that assault weapon has to be to a dangerous weapons permit holder because they are the only ones that are generally exempt uh, to receive that firearm in a sale. Um, so with that said... And, uh, yeah, and Matt, and likewise, any dealers listening in, your ability to deal in firearms currently meeting the definition of assault weapons, in order for you to do that, you need to have yourself a dangerous weapons permit as a dealer. Your federal firearms license and California dealer license alone will not be sufficient. And on top of that, DOJ is really clamping down on dealers who are in possession of assault weapons, even the ones that are newly defined as assault weapons this year, um, and potentially seeking criminal charges against dealers who are in possession of assault weapons without a dangerous weapons permit or engaged in the sales of these firearms. So be, dealers, you also need to be very careful with over now 1,800 people here. Um, uh, I'm assuming we have a couple dealers in the audience. 
go. So yes, as I mentioned, there will be a follow-up webinar that's not yet available, of course, uh, that will talk in more detail about what you can do to your firearms to modify them to be compliant with California law. And of course, in addition to the, these options that you have here, there is of course the option that individuals, some individuals may you know, choose uh, to simply not comply with the law. We, we get it. I, I know I'm a firearm owner myself. I, I completely understand that some people will be taking that position. Just know that for the purposes of this webinar, obviously, we're here to inform you on the options that are available to you under the law to avoid getting into any trouble or issues with law enforcement. Uh, we will also be preparing a webinar uh, specific to California gun owners uh, about how you can um, interact with police should, you're, should you encounter police for whatever reason. Uh, so just be on the lookout for those two webinars, uh, which will be available at a future time. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Joe, who's going to uh, hop in here, and he's going to talk specifically about the text of the regulations and how they affect you, as well as the registration process. So, Joe? Thanks, Matt. Um, and uh, feel free to jump in and interrupt me as much as I've, I've been interrupting you uh, concerning some of the questions <laughs> in chat um, or making clarifications as I might have glossed over or uh, made something a little bit too vague. I'm seeing two questions repeated that is an area of concern to me as I often see them echoed in cases where I am representing somebody for illegally possessing a assault weapon and getting prosecuted by the local or, in some cases, far away district attorney's office in California. Uh, the fact that you've purchased your firearm from a licensed firearm dealer, filled out all the DROS paperwork, waited your 10 days, and got the firearm, that is not registration of the firearm for purposes of assault weapon registration. There is a separate process. I'll go over it in a minute that you have to follow if you want to register your firearm as an assault weapon and uh, be in compliance with the requirements of California law if you continue to possess that firearm in that configuration. Matt already warned you, if you decide not to go through with this, you need to make a very real-world decision with respect to the possibility that somewhere in the future law enforcement will find you with that firearm if it is not in a California-compliant configuration. And like Matt said, we'll cover that in another webinar. Um, and it meets the definition of an assault weapon. You will be arrested, and you will more than likely be prosecuted for a felony. So keep that in mind in moving forward. The purposes of these webinars is not only to inform you but to prevent you from having to call us after you've been arrested, charged, and now facing felony charges um, and facing the very real possibility of that you're going to be prosecuted and potentially have a conviction on your record that you can't erase. And so we try to do this. This is why we wrote the book. This is why we've done multiple webinars on these new changes in the law because they are easy to run afoul of and one of the easiest ways to get into trouble when it comes to these types of firearms is assume that the DROS paperwork you filled out, it's the same process to register your firearm as an assault weapon. It is not. Or to assume that the firearms you purchased years and years ago were somehow, quote unquote, grandfathered in, or you have some type of exception to the restrictions in the law. The law has changed a couple of times concerning these firearms, and if you have not registered your firearms as the Sullivans and they're in an illegal configuration or they're make and model prohibited, you got yourself a substantial problem if somewhere in the future law enforcement stumbles across them. And there was a question earlier that I'll address as well. Um, having to do with the DOJ checking DROS records and if you don't register your firearms, whether or not they're going to come a knocking on your door. More than likely not, probably because the firearms we're talking about now, there's no way just by looking at the paperwork to say with 100% certainty whether or not that firearm is an assault weapon or you've modified it to be California compliant or you've simply taken the firearm apart. And so DOJ really won't know based on who purchased these firearms whether or not they're in possession of an illegal assault weapon after the registration period closes. More than likely, what I fully expect to happen is that the individuals who fail to register the firearms or make their firearm California compliant and have law enforcement stumble across them, lo and behold, they're going to be found out to be in possession or thought to be in possession of an illegal assault weapon and face the criminal charges I mentioned before. So that being on the table, um, we'll kind of go into 
the regulations, what um, we've kind of discussed before, a lot of this stuff is uh, the information we discussed before, like Matt said, very little has changed between the last version of the regulations, uh, which we've talked about, and the new version, but I'll be going in detail about the registration process, some of the odd situations in the registration process, and then going into a little bit more about the requirements of joint registration and um, deregistering or clarifying your registration with the DOJ. So first and foremost, the biggest question on most people's minds was what is a fixed magazine when the legislature decided to come out with that phrase as a requirement for a firearm so it does not meet the definition of an assault weapon, and you see it there, an ammunition feeding device contained in or permanently attached to the firearm in such a manner that the device cannot be removed without disassembly of the firearm action. And of course, the bold italicized red letters of disassembly of the firearm action, of course, became a problem because really no one really understood what that meant or exactly what firearms would qualify as having or requiring disassembly of the firearm action in order to not be considered an assault weapon. Nevertheless, bullet buttons are not considered to have fixed magazines for purposes of the new definition. So as a result, those firearms you purchased last year, you could purchase last year with a bullet button, provided there's no other modifications to the firearm, this year more than likely is considered an assault weapon. So all of those bullet button firearms people have been able to purchase for years, again, barring any other modifications to that firearm, more than likely that firearm is now considered an assault weapon. And so your decisions, uh, what to do about that firearm, that Matt has already mentioned before, come into play. And then, of course, I'll be talking about the process to go about and register the firearm with DOJ. Um, but there it is. I'm out of practice in moving slides. Sorry, guys. Okay, <laughs> so what does disassembly of the firearm action mean? Well, the DOJ in their regulations has decided to define it and uh, and actually clarified it for a lot of those people wondering whether or not uh, individuals possessing devices like the AR mag lock or permanently affixing their magazine to the firearm is a sufficient uh, answer. And to the answer to that question is yes, because disassembly of the firearm action um, is considered to be for the AR when you tip the upper receiver up and away from the lower receiver on that front pivot point. So if you remove that rear takedown pin and are able to pivot the firearm, I'm sorry, the upper receiver up and away from the lower receiver, that, as far as the regulations go, is considered disassembly of the firearm action. So all of those ingenious devices that prevent you from moving the magazine while the firearm is fully assembled and functioning and the only way for you to move, remove the magazine is for you to tip the upper receiver up or potentially even take it off entirely. Um, in those situations, that would cause your firearm to have a quote-unquote fixed magazine, and so therefore your firearm could have all of the other features that most ARs have attached to them, the pistol grips, the collapsible stocks, the flash suppressor, the forward pistol grip. You still can't have the grenade launcher on it, I'm sorry to say, because that's still considered a destructive device. Uh, but nevertheless, you can still have the firearm in that configuration, provided you have it with a fixed magazine. If you don't want to install that feature, the AR maglock feature I'm referring to, I mean, want to keep the bullet button on it, that firearm is probably still going to be considered an assault weapon. And if you want to keep it within the state of California, fully functioning and assembled, uh, registration is something you may want to strongly consider. And me as a criminal defense attorney, I would strongly consider for you to uh, to take that route. Uh, the same thing would apply. I've seen a number of questions uh, relations in relation to AR pistols. Same thing would apply, fellas. Those pistols are typically purchased, or at least last year were purchased, with the bullet button installed in them. Um, those pistols then were, for all intents and purposes, considered lawful to possess, barring some other modifications you could have tacked onto that. However, this year, that AR pistol with that bullet button more than likely is now considered an assault weapon. Again, the AR mag lock and those similar devices that require you to pivot up that upper receiver um, can be installed, but if you do not want to install those and keep that bullet button on it, you're going to have to strongly consider the possibility of registering the firearm or going featureless, of course, is another option. 
Um, and there's questions about featureless, and again, we'll discuss what featureless is, meaning that it lacks the features uh, that would cause the firearm to meet the definition of an assault pin in detail in a upcoming webinar. I'm assuming, Matt, and I don't know what your schedule is like, but I'm assuming we could probably get that webinar up within two or three weeks. Yeah, probably somewhere around there. I'm, I'm just going to make sure that if you guys want to be notified when the actual webinar will be available and when we'll be hosting it, uh, just make sure to subscribe to NRA and CRPA email alerts. Uh, if you do that, you should receive an email notification letting you know that we will be hosting that webinar at a specific date and time. Okay. Yeah. And um, moving forward, also, um, the definition of semi-automatic, that has not changed from the previous proposed regulations from before, and I addressed that before. In order for a firearm now meeting the definition of an assault weapon, uh, to be considered an assault weapon, it must be semi-automatic. And uh, as the slide in front of you shows, uh, DOJ has defined the term semi-automatic. Um, and again, it's a, a rather interesting definition in that in order for the firearm to be considered semi-automatic, it has to be fully functioning and assembled. If the firearm is not functioning due to the lack of some type of essential parts, like the firing pin, the bolt carrier, gas tube and does not work in a semi-automatic way, it won't be considered semi-automatic. Likewise, if you take the firearm completely apart, the firearm cannot be considered an assault weapon because it doesn't work. As a result, not semi-automatic. you got a bunch of parts laying there, which I guess if you bang the ammunition hard enough with one part, it'd go off. Um, but that's not semi-automatic for all intents and purposes. And so once the firearm is disassembled, he cannot be considered an assault weapon. However, if the firearm is disassembled and after July 1st of next year you reassemble that firearm with the bullet button attached to it and it's not a registered assault weapon or if you just put a firearm together currently that meets the definition of an assault weapon as of the laws of last year, you got yourself a bit of a problem as well. Um, and one area, uh, one additional area of concern the firearms that we're going to be talking about for purposes of registration, Matt mentioned it before, but I'll, I'll, I'll re-mention it. You had to possess those firearms fully assembled in a working configuration prior to January 1st of this year for you to register. You cannot go out and buy a lower receiver, a strip lower receiver or a lower assembly, and then put together your firearm in a bullet button configuration right now and register it. That, according to the penal code, is a no-no. If you want to register a firearm as a assault weapon under these new laws, you had to possess that firearm fully assembled prior to January 1st of this year. And so I saw a couple of questions relating to that. And yes, you can buy a lower receiver for an AR or a lower assembly and put that firearm together. However, you're going to need to put it together in a configuration that does not cause it to meet the definition of an assault weapon. For purposes of this conversation, that would more than likely include an AR mag lock or one of those other devices that would only allow you to remove the magazine by removing or tilting up the upper receiver if we're talking about an AR. So keep those in mind, too, if you are in, interested in moving forward this year in acquiring those types of firearms. It's not going to be a situation where you can put together your bullet button gun this year and try to register it. DOJ will probably know that you purchased it this year through the DRO system, and then, of course, would probably ping your registration as a result, and if in a bad situation, come visit you. Um, but going back to semi-automatic, uh, keep in mind that if your firearm is just disabled by a magazine lock or is simply just missing ammunition or the magazine, that is not considered disassembled and it's still considered semi-automatic for, for this definition. The upper removed completely from the lower most certainly is considered disassembled and not considered semi-automatic. And then, of course, a stripped lower receiver, not considered semi-automatic because, of course, everybody here probably well knows that a strip low receiver um, is lacking almost all of the other essential parts in order for it to function in semi-automatic mode. But keep in mind that the possession of, of the parts, which if put together can equal an assault weapon, can still land you in hot water. There is a criminal case at the bottom of the screen mentioned below 
um, poor Mr. Wynn possessed all of the parts, even though some of them weren't even completed, and expressed the intent to put together a quote-unquote AK-47. Law enforcement showed up, and Mr. Wynn told law enforcement that it was his intent to take those parts and put them together in into an AK-47. Well, law enforcement um, decided that wasn't too kosher, needed the Orange County District Attorney's Office, and then decided to prosecute him for attempted manufacturing and attempted possession of an assault weapon, and convicted him. Upon appeal, his conviction was still upheld, because in this case, poor Mr. Wynn had all of the parts to potentially complete a firearm into an assault weapon, expressed his intent to do so, and but for law enforcement showing up, probably would have done it. That is sufficient for the crime of attempt, and of course they dinged him for attempted manufacturing or attempted possession. So as the slide here mentions, if law enforcement wants to talk to you about any of your parts, any of your intent and what to do with your parts, I would strongly, again, as a criminal defense attorney, advise you to not answer those questions. Sorry, guys, I'm not going to answer that question. Have a nice day. I'm not going to answer that with an attorney being present. Sorry, guys, I'm going to invoke my right to remain silent. You can have a nice day. Any of those answers would, as far as I'm concerned, be sufficient, and then they have to try to gleam your intent with those parts on what you're going to do with them. So just because you take the firearm apart doesn't get you necessarily out of the woods, um, although your possession of a firearm as an assault weapon is substantially stymied as a result of that definition of semi-automatic. Um, and here's where... Quick, Go for it. Uh, yeah, just real quick. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in addition to a webinar discussing how you can make your firearms compliant with California law, as I mentioned, we will also be hosting a webinar that deals with specific issues regarding individuals such as gun owners yourself contacting law enforcement for whatever reason. So again, make sure you're subscribed to NRA and CRPA email alerts if you want to be informed and attend that specific webinar addressing those issues that Joe just discussed. So go ahead. Thank you. That gives me a chance to take a drink. Um, I saw a couple questions about Sega shotguns and other AK shotguns. That, unfortunately, and had been a sticking point back when these regulations were originally proposed, back at the end of last year, um, that was problematic. And unfortunately, with the implementation of these regulations, continues to be problematic because now they're California law. And under these new regulations, semi-automatic shotguns with bullet buttons and uh, now considered not fixed magazines are considered assault weapons. And so despite the fact that the legislature did not change the definition of a weapon for shotguns, the California Department of Justice did. And so while last year you could have purchased those shotguns with bullet buttons that would have otherwise had a quote-unquote detachable magazine, those firearms, as of a couple of days ago when these regulations were approved, uh, those firearms automatically became assault weapons. Those firearms would have to be registered as well if you want to keep them in that configuration as well, meaning the ones with the bullet button um, preventing you to have a, from having a quote-unquote detachable magazine. Again, there's a huge issue with this because, again, the legislature did not change the law. DOJ did with respect to bullet button shotguns. And so we'll have to see moving forward what's going to happen with respect to this regulation um, and its potential legality. But for the time being, shotguns, which would otherwise have detachable magazines and those that were able to require it at least until last or until January 1st of this year, that had bullet buttons, those are now considered assault weapons. And so DOJ has listed the firearms that they will not register in pretty good detail um, in the regulations. And, of course, those are include the ones that needed to be possessed or at least were possessed prior to January 1st. And so if you possess a firearm, as I mentioned before, that you put together and it meets the new definition of, definition of an assault weapon on or before or on or after, I should say, January 1st of this year, you're not going to be able to register it. You had to possess that firearm prior to January 1st of this year if you want to register the firearm under the new definition of a weapon. And, of course, they're not going to register firearms 
that should have been registered during the previous registration periods. So all those make model assault weapons or those firearms with the detachable magazines that should have been registered prior to last year, they too will not be registered. And of course your firearm is featureless, meaning that it does not have the features that would cause it to meet the definition of an assault weapon. They're going to refuse to register those. Of course, if you install a fixed magazine like an AR mag lock into that firearm, and of course the magazine holds less than 10 rounds, they're not going to register those. Of course, disassembled ones, so we mentioned why they won't register those because those aren't considered to be semi-automatic. Um, ones lacking serial numbers, and then, of course, if you've made the firearm yourself and it lacks the serial number and you di or you didn't go through the process to obtain the serial number, they're not going to register those as well. And we'll talk about that process uh, again here towards the end of this presentation. Uh, firearms not required to be registered. Again, those California combined are so-called feature list firearms. In other words, firearms that don't meet the definition of a sullipan or the new definition of a sullipan, those do still not need to be registered. And then, of course, disassembled firearms, since they're not semi-automatic being disassembled, um, they will not be able to or need to be registered. But, of course, always be careful if you're going to reassemble those firearms in a functioning configuration, how you do that. And so turning over to the registration process, um, you may or may not know that California has recently gone electronic with a number of their forms that people often need to fill out if they want to get guns back from law enforcement agencies or they want to do a personal firearms eligibility check to see if they're eligible to purchase firearms or if you're per tra or transferring firearms between family members or spouses. Uh, those forms are actually available and can be filled out online. And in fact, I typically advise people when having to fill out those forms to avail themselves of the electronic process as opposed to the paper forms. Uh, it seems that DOJ gets to and moves forward with those forms quicker than they would just the paper forms you have to send up to Sacramento in order to do that. But of course, they've expanded this process and this program to include the registration process for assault weapons. And so first and foremost, they're going to require that you fill out and create an account for yourself, relatively straightforward, full name, email address, and then, of course, some password uh, questions. A uh, sample of that application process is in front of you right now. Um, I also found it pretty interesting that once I filled out my name and email address, when I went about the process to register an assault weapon, it auto-filled on me. So make sure that when you fill out your name here and your email address here, here is the correct one, and then of course if it does or does not autofill on your Sullivan application, if you decide to go that route, um, that information is correct there as well. Um, but I noticed as soon as I started playing with the Sullivan registration process, um, my name and my email address was automatically entered. And so check that, double check it, um, and just make sure it's correct. But nevertheless, once you go ahead and move forward with you saw up an application or registration process, um, and once you get into the CRIS system, and the CRIS system is accessible from the California Department of Justice Bureau of Firearms website. Um, they've updated their website within like the last two, three weeks. If you simply scroll down on the California Department of Justice Bureau of Firearms website, you will see a, um, I don't remember what color it was, but it's a rectangle box basically saying register your assault weapon. That will take you directly to the, uh, the CFARS or CFARS website as people are now calling it and start you the process of getting a CFARS account. And then of course once you do that you can choose, it's the first form mentioned on the left hand side of the screen once you get a CFARS account um, is the form to register assault weapons. And so it's relatively easy to find. Um, but, of course, filling out all this information, not exactly fun and or exciting. But you see all of the information that um, is either required or not required going through the registration process, at least having to do with your information. Um, and here's an example of what you'll be seeing when you go ahead and do that. Um, it asks whether or not you already have an assault weapon registration number. Um, that is in part whether or not you've filled this out before and or you're doing it as a joint registration, uh, but nevertheless all the information is there and pertinent. Most of it relatively straightforward, name, last name, add your residence address, uh, your mailing address, 
not required, um, but if you want to certainly get information or a letter back from DOJ confirming uh, registration, you might want to have that mailing address there as well. Email address, they require at least one number. You don't need to do all three phone, business, and mobile numbers. Um, just, you can go ahead and provide one, but unfortunately a phone number is required for purposes of registration according to the code. Um, and we'll answer some of those or address some of those other questions or those lines further on. Um, I, we received a lot of questions concerning whether or not out-of-state residents can register their firearms. It does not appear to be the case, partly because of the ID requirements on the left. You're going to need one of the four, and only one of the four, in order to register your firearm as an assault weapon, California driver's license, California ID, and of course the people in the military, Department of Defense ID and military ID card, and of course they want the number for any one of those IDs. And so at that point, uh, without one of those IDs, I am almost positive your registration is going to get kicked unless you have one of those four and then of course provide the appropriate number. As I mentioned before, race is not a requirement in filling out this form, so those of you who do not want to fill this out do not necessarily need to, but there's a number to choose from. Um, if none of those uh, match you uh, personally, I'd probably choose other or potentially unknown, depending on the situation. Um, keep that in mind. Um, eye color and hair color, um, no other reason to point this out other than they kind of go pretty far afield with that hair color. Um, pink, purple, green. Um, it is California, after all. Uh, but nevertheless, it, I also want to point this out because when we start talking about joint registration and the relatively limited set of options you have for that situation, it's a little funny that DOJ decides to get really out there when it comes to hair color and eye color, um, but have a, still have a really narrow view when it comes to what consists of a family for purposes of joint registration. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there are those as well. Um, they're going to want to know your birthplace. If you're, a Cal or, I'm sorry, if you're a U.S. citizen or not a U.S. citizen, you pretty much see the same pull down. And as you can see there, uh, it's all countries under the sun, and hidden within the countries are the states, um, because you see Alaska and then Albania, um, and then Alberta, and then moving around, although Arkansas, for a lot of intensive purposes, is its own country. Um, but nevertheless, right after that, Armenia. Um, so um, scroll down, California is located for those California people there. Uh, but again, multiple things to choose from. I've seen a number of questions when it comes to joint registration. Unfortunately, the regulations have not changed at all. Um, with respect to joint registration um, that I discussed in the past, um, as it mentions there, the penal code has in the past and still contemplates joint registration uh, for assault weapons. And I would strongly advise you, if you have family members who, with whom you can register firearms jointly, to avail yourself of that process of the and those options, because the scenario is one I mentioned before, and it bears repeating for those of you who might not have heard me do this before. And it's this. Say a husband and wife are married, however the, well, let's, let's be Californian. Uh, the wife is the registered owner of the assault weapon. Uh, the husband um, wants no part of her guns. Uh, nevertheless, she only registers the firearm to herself as an assault weapon. She goes the ways to work. Uh, he stays at home with the kids. If the firearm is accessible to him and not registered to him, he's in violation of California law. He is in possession of a assault weapon and is not registered to him. So when July 1st comes around and that firearm isn't jointly registered to him and her, he is potentially in violation of California law. He's committing a felony. And if law enforcement were to stumble across him in possession of that firearm, um, he could very well see the very real possibility of felony criminal charges. Likewise, if she only registers the firearm as an assault weapon, he says, hey, honey, can I take your firearm to the range? She says, sure. He heads on out to the range with her registered assault weapon, and it's not registered to him, goes to the range. Law enforcement decides to walk down the line checking registrations or just looking over firearms, sees that firearm and says, hey, where's your registration paperwork? says, well, I don't have any. 
Um, and they run the firearm. Sure enough, it's only registered to the wife. He's got himself a serious problem. So when we're talking about joint registration, again, my advice is to, if you have the option to do so, uh, register it jointly amongst your family members, but you're going to be limited to whom you may register it. Again, you're going to have to, and let's back up a second, they're going to have to be family members who are residing in the same household. So if a little Sally or, or Johnny are off to school or have now you've succeeded in kicking them outside of the house and they have their own apartments, uh, they aren't residing in the same household as you. Your ability to jointly register those firearms uh, goes away. It's going to have to be your family members residing in the same household as you are. And those family members are highlighted in red about in the middle of the slide. Spouses, children, uh, parents, children, grandchildren, grandparents, uh, domestic partners, and siblings. Those are the only quote-unquote family members with whom you may register your assault weapon. Um, aunts and uncles who may be living with you, uh, extended family. Um, if my in-laws were to move in with me, um, as they get up in years, um, medical issues become a problem, and you're having more and more extended families living together in the same household. However, if I have an, a, an aunt or an uncle move in with us, um, he or she's not going to be able to have that firearm registered to him or her. Likewise, they aren't going to be able to take it away from the residence without a registered owner accompanying them. And then, of course, if they're there alone with it and they have access to it, there's the potential problem there. And so... Keep that in mind when you're having to go through joint registration. And then, of course, when registering these things as the joint residency and, or I'm sorry, uh, joint registrants, and we'll talk about that here in half a second when we go over the forms, uh, one family member is going to register the firearm as the primary registrant. And then each and every other joint registrant of that firearm will have to fill out and complete a joint registration form for themselves to register that firearm jointly with uh, the primary registrant. And again, that date, December 31st, 2017, is the old date. Um, that is now changed. That should be June 30th, 2018 for joint registration. So just keep that in mind as well, that the person has to be 18 years of age prior to June 30th, 2018, uh, for a joint registration, partly because the penal code prohibits minors to be in possession of um, an assault weapon. And so DOJ extends that and says, okay, well, if you can't be in possession of an assault weapon minor, you can't have it registered to you either. So there's those things. Some of the questions discussed below still haven't been addressed. Um, if the primary registrant is not the person to whom the firearm is already registered when they purchased the firearm through DROS, I don't foresee DOJ having a problem with that, but it's not entirely clear. And so I would suggest if the person who purchased the firearm, they should be the, the primary registrant, and then, of course, wives or children, grandchildren, uh, grandparents, uh, siblings who reside in that household registering as well, they would be the person who are doing the joint registration with that primary registrant. Um, but here's the what you'll see in filling out this paperwork on the uh, CFARS system, uh, as soon as you hit that, it is, is it your intention to joint register this firearm, uh, you, but the bottom information is going to pop out. If it stays no, you're not going to see that bottom information. But as soon as you hit yes on that, the rest pops out. And then, of course, ask you if you're the primary registrant. And then if so, what's the relationship with at least the first individual with whom you're going to do the registration? And you need to fill out their name as well. You can do multiple people, although at this point the form here only allows for one person. Uh, there is a comment section at the end of the form where you would add the person's name, your relationship, um, as well with that individual. So if you had multiple people and you're the primary regist registrant, you fill out the first person's name and information here. And then in the comments field at the bottom, you're going to fill out everybody else's uh, information. So if you have uh, your spouse, 
you're registering the firearm with and you still have a couple of adult children with you who are going to be also the registrants, uh, their information would go in the comments field in below. And then, of course, your spouse and your kids are going to need to fill out their own uh, information concerning the firearm um, and the registration. And when it comes to the person filling out their own information um, and being not the primary res registrant, you'll see the information um, that they're going to need to fill out. They're going to reflect their relationship to the primary registrant and, then of course, the name of the primary registrant. And once that primary registrant fills out uh, the information for that firearm, they're going to be given a CRIS number, a C-R-I-S number. Um, you're going to need to fill out that information as well to link your registration to the primary registrant's information right there. And unfortunately, and I've seen some questions before about this, and so I'll address those here. Uh, in addition to the information for joint registration having to do with your relationship with them and, uh, of course, their names, DOJ is going to want proof that they actually reside in your same household. And so you're going to need some sort of documentation that you're going to need to attach to the application, or I'm sorry, the registration form in order to prove that. And they kind of give you a list of things that you can choose from. Uh, I know a lot of times this information is difficult to come across. We're dealing with the same kind of situation when somebody's trying to purchase a handgun and they need that ridiculous second piece of California residency. And often, as the case, it's very difficult to come by. As of right now, these are it when it comes to showing that you reside as the same per in the same residence as the primary reg registrant, and the primary registrant should be providing this information as well uh, for purposes of his or her registration. But nevertheless, it's any one of those documents would be sufficient for purposes of the registration. And unfortunately, I see one question right here in passing, driver's license, not there. And so in order to for you to go ahead and do that, I mean, in trying to get something that's fairly easy to get, um, certificate of eligibility one, not too difficult to get. It takes some time. A vehicle registration, I would hope, would be at the same place where you're residing, although often it's not. Um, hunting license is sometimes difficult to obtain. Of course, if you have kids, utility bill might be difficult to obtain as well. Uh, but unfortunately, this is the, the universe of uh, documents that they will accept for you to prove that you are a joint registrant or you reside at the same residence of a joint registrant. Um, moving forward even further, uh, you have some additional questions when it comes to, again, the self-built firearms. And we'll go back to that. There is no additional information because it's on that previous uh, slide. And some of you were keen on looking at it. That first question is, asked, is the firearm self-built, yes or no? Um, as soon as you hit yes, nothing else changes with respect to the form. Um, but nevertheless, if you're doing one of those 80% builds and you're registering it as an assault weapon, or you've done one of those 80% builds, um, and you're registering that firearm as an assault weapon, you're going to need to do that pull down um, and just flip that no to a yes. And then, of course, you have the other information for joint registration and primary registra registration, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, but now you've gone through that fun and exciting process, we're not done yet, because then we have to start, start describing that firearm. You've got pretty much three options to choose from when it comes to type of firearm. Rifle, pistol, shotgun, because that's the three types of firearms that are classified uh, as assault weapons. The issue here being is that after you do that, you have to choose a category, a quote-unquote category of the firearm. Keep in mind, the only firearms that you and DOJ allows you to register are semi-automatic. Semi-automatic pistols, semi-automatic rifles, semi-automatic shotguns. Why on earth you need all of these other options is a bit beyond me, because if your firearm's not semi-automatic, for purposes of this new registration process, it's not considered an assault weapon. Uh, but nevertheless, they've given you all of these other options that you don't need in order for purposes of registration, because really the only thing you can and should be clicking is semi-automatic. And then, of course, when you want to describe your firearm, you have 
almost as much as all those countries and states to choose from, um, a whole bunch of makes. Um, go ahead and go through that. I would hope everyone finds everything that they're looking for. If you find a firearm that does not line up with the make listed here, unfortunately there is no other, there is no not, not applicable. Uh, all of those are the universe of makes available. I would choose, if you can find something equivalent to what you have, choose that, and then potentially in the comment field specify, I could not find my make designation in your pull-down menu. The make of my firearm is X. Um, but nevertheless, there's a whole bunch. And as we mentioned before, be very careful on how you're filling this out. And just by playing around with this a little bit, I was able to come up and create a whole bunch of firearms that I could not register as assault weapons, but nevertheless are illegal for me to possess in the state of California. So I've got a a Taurus pistol, or a Taurus Judge revolver um, that shoots 410 shotgun shells. That, unfortunately, is a short barrel shotgun. Nevertheless, I was able to fill out that type of firearm. Uh, as mentioned before, Category 1 assault weapons, your Colt AR 15A2s, uh, those are assault weapons, and you cannot register those through this new process. That's going to be one of those situations wherein DOJ may be showing up at your door if you try to register one of those firearms. You can't or you needed to register before, and then, of course, a 50 BMG rifle. I got a Barrett uh, 50 BMG. Uh, nevertheless, be very careful. If the firearm you're trying to register you don't know you can lawfully register or needed to be registered previously, contact an attorney. Matt also pointed out that flow chart that should be available on the, uh, the CRPA website that specifies which firearms will need to be registered prior to July 1st um, of this coming year or those firearms that needed to be registered already. If your firearm is one that needed to be registered already and you have pretty good cause to believe that you haven't, uh, you might want to talk to an attorney about that. So be very careful about the firearms you register here and you should know whether or not the firearm uh, is when you need to register now. And if you have any questions or concerns, like I said, follow that flow chart. If not, contact an attorney. Um, our book also discusses at length the firearms that were previously considered to be assault weapons and needed to be registered prior to this year. So any one of those Jump, situations. Jump real quick. Go for it. Yeah, sorry. So some of you guys asked, Joe's mentioning that flow chart. It is now available on CRPA's website. I put a link there in the participant feedback section uh, as well. If you uh, wanted to click on that, you can check that out there. So it's now available. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Matt. Yes, and yeah, if you do check the chat, I can see Matt has done the link there. Um, for those firearms that have previously, well, you can kind of take your firearm through the flow chart process if you end up in a situation where your firearm is not already registered in the SOL and, and you get to a stop that says this firearm is in the SOL and needed to be registered prior to July 1st of next year, you probably need to talk to an attorney about what to do about that. Uh, but moving forward, they also specify the types of caliber your firearm is. Um, we had some questions about that in the past, especially when we're talking about the you know, the AR platform and it being kind of this Swiss Army knife of firearms, and you can add a whole bunch of attachments and change out upper assemblies and change calibers on that. You do have the ability to do a multi at the very end of that huge list of calibers, a uh, firearm with interchangeable barrels. If you wanted to register the firearm as a quote-unquote multi, that would be the one I suggest using. Uh, of course, AR is standard 223. Um, but nevertheless, if you had multiple barrels or interchangeable, I should say not barrels, um, uh, upper receivers, uh, you might want to avail yourself of that option if you got the one upper that you're happy and content with being your one and only upper. Um, go ahead and choose the applicable caliber in that situation. Um, but again, all the caliber, I'm not going to say all the calibers in the world because that's just assuming way too much. Uh, but nevertheless, a, a whole heck of a lot of calibers there. And DOJ mentions that if the one that you use in your firearm is not there, choose something that's close. Okay. 
um, <laughs> choose something at least, and by measurements wise, um, is close. But nevertheless, that's what DOJ suggests doing, and then actually putting the caliber um, into the comment section, like you do registration of multiple family members. You got some more fun things to choose from when it comes to color, barrel length, magazine. They only give you one option. Um, it's going to be a non-fixed magazine in this situation. I don't know why they don't have that for semi-automatic as category, but nevertheless, uh, for here they have that. And then for cartridge, um, you know, only option for shotguns and rifles is center fire. For pistols, you can choose between center fire and rim fire. For pistols, keep in mind that, that regardless of whether or not the firearm is center fire or rim fire, it can still meet the definition of an assault weapon if the prohibited features are pr uh, present. Uh, for rifles, a firearm cannot be considered an assault weapon based on its features, at least, if the firearm is rimfire. So that's why they give you center fire only. And then shotguns um, being what they are, center fire only is the option for cartridge on those as well. Uh, however, once you choose your rifle or your pistol, these two windows will show up depending on what you chose for your firearm. So if your rifle shows up, you have a whole bunch of other options with respect to clarifying uh, what is attached to your firearm, and more particularly in this case, why does the firearm meet the definition of a solo weapon? Because in addition to not having a fixed magazine, and in this case a bullet button, you need to have one or more of these other features in order for it to be considered an assault weapon. Uh, and so in this situation, check the ones applicable. However, there's a potential pitfall. Um, that semi-automatic center fire rifle with overall length less than 30 inches, that Matt is highlighting right now, thank you so much, Matt, uh, that firearm or that type of firearm should have been registered as an assault weapon a number of years ago. It is still troubling and questionable as to why that firearm can be, that type of firearm can be chosen here because, again, that, that classification of a uh, rifle uh, has been considered an assault weapon since 2001. Uh, why that is here, again, highly questionable. And if you're going to be checking, or checking that box prior to registration, you should really talk to an attorney first because I don't know if this is an oversight by DOJ, uh, whether or not they are really and honestly willing to accept registrations for these types of firearms, or uh, as Star Wars puts it, it's a trap. Uh, and so uh, without further clarification from DOJ as to why that is there, I would strongly caution anybody choosing that option for purposes of registration. And last but not least, they did change the definition or at least clarified what the definition of overall length is. It made DOJ basically trying to say that we understand that we've redefined um, overall length uh, but it would still be a little odd for DOJ to allow registration of those types of firearms, partly because, uh, partly because again, those types of firearms needed to be registered a number of years ago. And as for pistols, you'll need to specify uh, the additional features on that pistol that would cause it to meet the definition of an assault weapon uh, as well. Um, and uh, for those of you who listened to my lecture in the past, this was always an area of concern for me as well, because in addition to all of that information, uh, you're going to need to fill out the date you acquired it from and from whom. And as I mentioned before in previous lectures, uh, you're not required to actually know this information, so the fact that DOJ is forcing you to do this is a little bit troubling. Wherein, uh, and on top of that, in the past for assault weapon registrations, this information was optional. It's required now. And so you're going to have to still fill out the data acquired and from whom. Um, again, if you don't know for sure, uh, it's very hard to get perjury on something that you don't know exactly. So your best guess would be my piece of advice. And then from whom acquired, you have a very limited option uh, in that regard, 80%. Builders, of course, you're going to choose that self-build option. But nevertheless, once you f choose any one of those options, uh, the field will expand and will basically have all of the same information as uh, as it's put forth in the bottom left. Um, and I've just put the I pulled down the firearm dealer one just as a indication. It's going to have dealer name, but if you get it from a family member, it's going to ask your family member's name, uh, their address, and any other comments. 
you want to fill in there. Problem being is that sometimes people don't follow all of the prerequisite requirements in acquiring firearms. And so if you acquired the firearm within the last year and you didn't go through a licensed firearm dealer and you got it from another private party transfer and you're not exempt from going through a dealer, in filling out this information you may very well be admitting to a crime. So if you have any questions or concerns or you have any concerns about the legality of how you acquired your firearm, again, it's something you should be discussing with an attorney or potentially walking that type of transaction back or discussing other types of options as opposed to providing this information directly to the California Department of Justice that could be used to incriminate yourself. On top of that, once you fill out that street address and that zip code, the rest will autofill, or at least auto to some extent. You'll notice on the right that say that there are gun stores on the island of Manhattan. Um, the once I put in the zip code for um, New York, it autofilled the state and gave me a limited option with respect to uh, the cities I could choose from. Some locations, uh, I noticed there was, I, I also plugged in a, a zip code for Orange County. It automatically knew I was in the city of Orange, and that was the only option it gave me. Um, so the rest of that would autofill, and I would assume autofill correctly. Um, and then we get to the pictures. That hasn't changed. Um, for purposes of registering your firearm as an assault weapon, you're going to need those four pictures as we've discussed before. What these mean and what they are and what they require, still not entirely clear. But nevertheless, DOJ still wants quote-unquote clear pictures depicting the bullet button, uh, the right and left side of the frame or receiver, and then, of course, a picture depicting the firearm from front to end. What exactly or what those pictures should look like is anybody's guess. But nevertheless, the ones below, as far as I'm concerned, should work. Um, whether or not they will it remains to be seen. We do know that DOJ, at least with respect to people who have already availed themselves of the registration process, when DOJ has questions, they follow up. And so we know DOJ has reached out to some reg registrants when it comes to questions relating to the firearm they're attempting to register. I haven't heard any having to do with pictures yet, uh, but nevertheless, I expect there to become, or them to be coming, assuming that DOJ is doing their job in following up on this stuff. But nevertheless, um, the DOJ does answer some questions with respect to the type of format they accept, the maximum size, but beyond that, there's a lot of stuff still uh, not uh, considered. I've seen pictures of firearms ticked up against walls taken from across the room, and so the picture is only about the size of a dime when it comes to the firearm. Uh, remains to be seen whether or not that type of picture will be accessible um, or acceptable to by the California Department of Justice. I have a feeling a person is going to get a call and a question about that firearm. Uh, the fees association with registration, it's 15 bucks per person. However, it's per registration. So there's no limit to with respect to the number of assaultants you can for purposes uh, register. For purposes of those $15, it's one or 100. God bless you if you're doing 100, uh, but nevertheless, it's still that one fifteen bucks. And then, of course, once you do that, in order to get uh, copies, it's another five dollar fee for you to get a copy of your self registration. Uh, like I said below, it doesn't cost you anything to make multiple copies of your own registration. I would advise you to make a lot, keep the original, and then, of course, when you're transporting that firearm or you have that firearm uh, with you always have a copy of your registration. And as I mentioned above, I jumped over it. Um, but of course, the registration and the payment, um, credit or debit card only since we're doing this all on the website, and, um, and electronic processing. Um, the application process, you need to submit those applications prior to June 30th, 2018. This time, that, uh, that date is 100% correct. Um, I would advise if you're going to avail yourself of this process, do it sooner rather than later. As you may well know, there are challenges to these laws currently happening right now. I can't say where or how these are going to go, whether or not we're going to be able to be successful on this. But ultimately, my job is to prevent 
people from getting dinged or prosecuted uh, for not violating California's laws. And if you're in possession of a firearm that meets the definition of an assault weapon and it's not registered to you as of June 30th, 2018, or more accurately put, you haven't submitted your paperwork uh, on or before that date, and July 1st, 2018 rolls around, and you didn't submit paperwork, and it's not already registered to you, you're in violation of California law. I do not want to have a conversation with any thousands of you in this group uh, who are unfortunately found in possession of an unlawful assault weapon. Uh, what you ultimately plan to do with a firearm is up to you, uh, but I don't want to have a conversation at that point because at that point, depending on the situation and the leniency of the prosecutor, uh, within the, full, the first year after registration, those violations could be charged as an infraction only. It depends on the number of circumstances. However, if you don't fall under those circumstances, or at least when you get arrested, law enforcement is not going to know that, and they're going to arrest you on the felony. Almost all jurisdictions in California, if they find you in the illegal possession of an assault weapon or think you're in the illegal possession of an assault weapon, are going to arrest you for a felony. It's just how things have worked, and have, after doing this for 11 years, uh, that's what my experience has been. Uh, so uh, there's all of that information there. And moving forward, if DOJ determines your application to be incomplete in some way or another, they're going to reach out to you. And like I said, we know DOJ has reaching out to people already or as this is going on uh, for clarification or to address questions or concerns. If that's not done or uh, those concerns aren't addressed or information is not provided within 30 days, they kick your application. You need to reapply. And so keep in mind that if you fail, if you've applied, and they come back to you and they say, hey, we need some clarification on this and that and the other thing, and you fail to get back to them, and then all of a sudden your window closes on June 30th of next year, uh, your firearm is not going to get registered as an assault weapon. So bear that in mind and moving forward as well, that if you're going about this process and they have questions, and you don't want to have to pay 15 bucks again, um, I would suggest you come up with their questions or concerns with one caveat. If they're just asking for additional picture or they're asking for a, maybe a closer view of a, an attachment to the firearm, say the uh, bullet button, that's one thing. If they're getting very interested in the wherefore, whys, and hows you acquired this firearm from whom and they want additional information relating to that, I would suggest you talk to an attorney about it for answering any of those questions because, again, DOJ is, well, pretty straightforward in the information they're requiring. And then on top of that, as I've just said, some of that information that they're requiring, if you answer them truthfully and correctly and you didn't acquire the firearm legally, is basically you admitting to a crime. And if DOJ is looking for information concerning that, you might want to talk to an attorney before providing any additional information. So, again, you have 30 days with respect to giving a DOJ answer for purposes of the registration. And, again, if it's benign things like, hey, your picture is fuzzy, can you send us another picture of the overall firearm? Or can you give us a picture of how the collapsible stock? Okay, that's one thing. But if it's, hey, can you tell us from whom, when, how you acquired this firearm, bells and whistles should be going off. They'd be going off for me if somebody contacts me concerning that issue. So bear that in mind in moving forward with respect to that further information. And again, if you have any questions or concerns relating to the legality of your firearm or how and when and whether or not it was illegally obtained or when you put it together, how and when you did that, Talk to an attorney. There's a lot of information. The flowcharts, when we mentioned the book is another one, or contacting our office, speak to an attorney, because uh, we know guns, um, that you can follow up on. Here's another issue. Once your information has been received and DOJ begins the process to register your firearm, they're going to do a personal, they're going to do an eligibility check on you. If you have any questions on whether or not you're eligible to possess firearms, do not try to register an assault weapon. 
because you can have purchased this firearm years ago with the bullet button on it become prohibited by virtue of certain misdemeanor convictions or a protective order or if you had a bad day and you had to spend some time in the hospital on a 5150 hold. And then lo and behold, you're trying to register an assault weapon and DOJ finds out about it, they are going to be paying you a visit. I don't doubt that at all, and I I shudder to think of the people who are my potential future clients who go through this process not knowing they're prohibited or thinking that there's no problem with their past criminal conviction for domestic violence or that protective order wasn't such a big deal, but I tried to register an assault weapon and then DOJ showed up. I don't want that to happen to anybody here listening to the sound of my voice um, or anybody who will do that in the future. So keep that in mind. If you have any questions or concerns, there's that personal firearms eligibility check you can do. And if you register to the the CFARS website, you can do that electronically online, or you could submit it um, through the paper system and download that form from the California Department of Justice website. Go through that process first, and then see. Or if you have any questions right now, and you think, wait a second, I have stuff in my past that might prohibit me, and I'm still in possession of firearms, you might want to talk to an attorney as well. So keep that in mind. Um, We had a lot of questions concerning those of you who have availed yourself of the process by which you complete a firearm from a quote-unquote 80% receiver, and now it meets the definition of an assault weapon because you put that firearm together last year, and, of course, they had a bullet button on it, and now this year it's considered an assault weapon. Uh, DOJ and their regulations didn't change anything with respect to this. And so prior to you registering that firearm as an assault weapon now, there is one other process you will need to go through. You will need to uh, contact California Department of Justice, fill out the form for purposes of uh, the acquisition of the serial number, and then, of course, embed, or I should say engrave is a better way to say it, that serial number onto the firearm in addition to other uh, marking requirements for that firearm. And so there is a form for you to fill out to seek the serial number. The DOJ will provide you that serial number, and then you will have to provide, or you have to add that serial number onto the firearm in addition to information uh, about the firearm. Um, that form has a number of questions about the wherefore, whys, and hows you acquired that firearm. From I would dare say all of you, if you've personally completed that firearm from an 80% receiver yourself, none of those should be applicable because you're not acquiring them from anybody else. You're assembling that firearm or completing that firearm yourself. Keep in mind that, like before, this is a potential trap because if you're trying to get an a firearm registered to you as an assault weapon that was completed from an 80% receiver and you had somebody else make that firearm for you or complete that firearm for you and you exchange money for them or, or with them, you get yourself a potential problem in that, as mentioned before, manufacturing firearms requires a federal firearms license. There are a number of people in this state who have gotten to serious trouble for per, uh, for assembling or completing 80% receivers on behalf of other individuals and then giving them the firearm in exchange for money or any other type of compensation. Um, if you did not do, if you went through that process, you might want to talk to, again, an attorney before filling out that paperwork when it comes to where you acquired the firearm from and from whom. Um, saw a lot of questions concerning modification of the firearm. Again, this hasn't changed from before. The regulations basically outline that removing the bullet button once the firearm is registered is a no-no unless you're going about the process to deregister the firearm as an assault weapon. You can, once the firearm is registered, take all of the prohibiting features apart, or off of the firearm and cause that firearm to not be considered an assault weapon. And, if that, and then at that point, if you wanted to deregister the firearm as an assault weapon, you may. Keep in mind that once it's deregistered, there's no re-registration, so slapping the bullet button back on it and putting all those prohibited features back on it um, is out of the question. But for purposes of once the firearm is registered, That bullet button, according to California Department of Justice, needs to stay on it. The question then is, what happens to all of the other parts? Well, DOJ doesn't specify. 
they'll have an indication from you and pictures uh, detailing what firearm features are attached to your firearm that would cause it to make or to meet the definition of an assault weapon, like a pistol grip or a collapsible stock or presumably a flash suppressor. There still is no restriction on you removing any of those parts from the firearm, and I dare say adding those any other additional parts onto the firearm that would still cause that registered assault weapon to be considered a quote-unquote assault weapon, with the exception of the grenade launcher. So... <laughs> People, are, again, are always asking about modification. Here's the clarification. Leave the bullet button on it, but beyond that, you should be able to add or remove any of the other parts that would cause the firearm to meet the definition of an assault weapon once it is properly registered. And again, if you wanted to take the firearm um, completely apart and cause the firearm to fall out of the definition of an assault weapon, and then have it still be fully functioning, you still can, provided it does meet the definition of an assault weapon, and then you can remove it from the registration as an assault weapon if you wanted to go that route. So there's, there's those options for you as well. Uh, and like I mentioned before, there is the possibility and the process to deregister the firearm if you don't want it to I'll be registered as an assault weapon anymore, but like I said, at that point, the firearm can't have any of those features that would cause it to be considered an assault weapon. And in moving forward, um, that kind of about covers it for purposes of the assault weapon stuff. Again, some reminders of what uh, recently happened with respect to California law and some of the other pending changes. Of course, that theft loss report reporting requirement has come into place as after July 1st, so within five days of you knowing or reasonably should have known that your firearm was lost or stolen, um, you're going to have to report that to law enforcement. Failure to do so is an infraction. Um, and then, of course, illegally reporting a crime or unlawful, or I should say untruthfully, uh, reporting a crime is still a crime under California law. Um, it's a little more serious than an infraction. Um, the ban on the possession of large capacity magazines um, for right now, the enforcement in the state. Of course, goodness knows where that case is going to go or end up. I saw some questions in the chat when it came to this. Uh, the ban on the possession of large capacity magazines is stayed. All of those activities that were illegal last year um, continue to be illegal with respect to large capacity magazines. So all of the banned activities, your importation, manufacturing, keeping, offering, exposing for sale, giving, lending, buying, receiving, all of those activities are still prohibited under California law. For right now, the, uh, the injunction is only for the restriction on possession. Uh, so that's an important distinction to make. Also because uh, the restriction on uh, possession unlike um, the activities, is a lesser offense. Um, the activities still can be prosecuted as a misdemeanor or a felony. And again, those aren't enjoined. So if you imported a large capacity magazine or you manufactured one or you sold one or gave them to somebody you're not allowed to, you could be prosecuted still for a felony. Your possession is still lawful. Um, coming January 1st, 2018, to gun stores near you are all of the restrictions with respect to ammunition acquisition through a dealer. So all of those things you've been hearing about with respect to having ammunition sent to a licensed firearm dealer or a vendor before you can receive it. Of course, private sales of ammunition having to go through a licensed vendor. Um, certain exceptions apply, uh, most notably those for licensed target ranges, provided that ammunition almost universally stays at that range. Um, all of that's going to apply. Um, the importation by residents of California into the state is going to be a big no-no, again, unless uh, an exception applies. And then, of course, um, those of you who are not licensed California firearm dealers, but nevertheless you sell ammunition, you're going to need to get a vendor's license. And then, of course, firearm dealers and vendors, if you are selling ammunition, you're going to need it locked up and inaccessible to the customers. I should be said to say locked up or inaccessible to the customers. Uh, and then, of course, July 1st, we have the ghost gun restrictions in place before you manufacture 
a so-called ghost gun, typically what you'd consider an 80% or complete an 80% receiver after July 1st. You're going to need to get permission from DOJ prior to doing that and then slap a serial number that DOJ will provide you onto that firearm within, uh, within, a, moment, uh, within a short period of time after completing that firearm. And then, of course, if you've completed a firearm, uh, from an 80% receiver prior to July 1st, 2018, and that firearm is not already registered to you uh, from July 1st, 2018 and prior to January 1st, 2019, you're going to have to get that serial number from DOJ, slap it on there, and show to DOJ that you did that. We have not seen, nor do we aware of, any regulations from DOJ when it comes to the so-called ghost gun restrictions. However, um, if you avail yourself of the registration process for assault weapons, that should suffice for the ghost gun requirements because that firearm will then be registered to you as an assault weapon in California. And the laws with respect to ghost guns detail that you do not need to re-register firearms already registered to you. That should suffice. But like I said before, we haven't seen the regulations on this yet. And DOJ did a whole bunch of fun things when it came to the assault weapon registration regulations. We don't know whether or not it's going to change or they're going to do some other odd things when it comes to the ghost guns. One would assume that's going to parallel what they're doing with the assault weapons, but we don't and can't say for certain. So when that comes out, when we see those, hopefully DOJ gets their act together a little more quickly when it comes to those activities. Um, but nevertheless, we will be here having the same conversation I'm assuming we had before. Uh, concerning this stuff. Uh, last but not least, July 1st, 2019, that's when the background checks come into play for purposes of ammunition acquisition, and on top of that, uh, the registration of ammunition purchasers comes into play. So uh, as of January 1st of next year, all of the dealer requirements go into play, um, but the record keeping and the background checks that will not come into play until July 1st, 2019. And, of course, that is the same day uh, the third and final phase of the lead ammo ban in California comes into play. Um, that about does it for us. Matt, did any questions and concerns um, that you saw jump out to you, or do you have a number of ones you might want to talk about and discuss? Uh, no, but I'll, I'll just jump in here on sort of the last slide, too. So, obviously, we posted this in the beginning before the presentation started. Uh, there is a book that's available to uh, to purchase that's shown here. It's uh, California Gun Laws produced by our office uh, by Chuck Michelle and Joseph Oso, who was just speaking. It covers pretty much A to Z everything regarding California firearms law. So if you have any questions regarding California firearms law in general, this is a great resource to start uh, to see if it answers your question. Uh, outside of that, I know some people are asking regarding potential legal challenges to things like the ammunition laws and some of the other laws that are going to affect. Of course, those lawsuits are in the work. Are, are in the works right now, and so we are getting to prepare to file those. And so if you are interested in being a plaintiff in a lawsuit like that, of course, please send an email to potentialplaintiffs at michellelawyers.com. Additionally, there will be upcoming webinars, as we talked about earlier. Uh, we will be doing a webinar regarding the, uh, the way to make a firearm featureless or California compliant. We will try and address all of the aftermarket modifications that are available to California gun owners right now, to, and we will be talking about whether or not we think that those will be acceptable within the, within the eyes of California law. And we will also be doing another webinar at a later date discussing police interactions uh, regarding with California gun owners. So if, if you're interested in those uh, at a later date, please make sure you're subscribed to NRA and CRPA email alerts. Uh, that way you'll be notified of when those webinars become available. And additionally, past webinars regarding a lot of the laws that Joe was just talking about, such as the ammunition bill, the ghost gun bill, and everything else, uh, are available right now on CRPA's website. Uh, so you can go to crpa.org slash webinars, and you'll see those webinars for those other laws that were recently passed last year, including Proposition 63. And I think that's it, unless, Joe, you have any other, uh, any other questions or, or comments? Um, yeah, if you guys, uh, I mean, we can open this up for uh, like five more, ten more minutes of questions. Usually at the end of these things, um, my voice is fried. Uh, but nevertheless, um, if you want to throw some more questions in the chat, we'll address whatever we can. Of course, reaching out to CRPA uh, concerning addressions, questions or concerns as well. Um, I also realize that when we do this, um, you guys spam chat pretty hard. So I'll do my best to keep up with I, I can't keep up with you, honest to God. You guys are 
way too many people still. Uh, and thank you all for um, uh, sticking around. Um, we still have 1,500 plus uh, in the chat, and um, we went a little long, as these often do. Um, to address some of the questions as they're screaming by real quick, um, I saw a question about law enforcement. Law enforcement, no. No additional exceptions for you other than the ones that already exist. So um, enforcement, if you have any firearms now meeting the definition of an assault weapon, uh, now you still have to go through the process like everybody else, I'm sorry to say. Um, the acquisition of assault weapons by law enforcement, that law is unchanged from what you had to go through before so that um, agency letters still applies. Uh, those of you coming to you from out of state with firearms meeting the definition of an assault weapon, a horrible idea. Um, there is a very limited exception for purposes of coming here to engage in a um, shooting competition. It's a very narrow exception. Um, and so you're going to want to double check and make sure you avail yourself of it. And it's so narrow, I apologize. I can't do that one off the top of my head. Um, and so uh, there's that. Um, uh, there are questions concerning large cap mags um, with respect to the assault weapons. Those don't usually go together. The assault weapon, uh, large cap mag ban um, is, like I said before, stayed. Um, if you registered your assault weapon previously, um, uh, those two don't go together. So if the ban comes back into effect, even though you have a registered assault weapon for which that that magazine can be used, unfortunately that that magazine would not need to be possessed if that is the situation uh, with respect to the large cat mag. Um, let me see what else. Oh, if you've uh, I'll, registered I'll an assault weapon. Yeah, go, Matt, if you saw one. Yeah, so so there's there's a couple questions I'm seeing regarding uh, some of the legal challenges that are currently pending as well as potential future legal challenges. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, NRA and CRPA put out this sort of bi-monthly California legal affairs report. It covers all of the firearm litigation here in California, including, for example, I see some questions regarding micro-stamping. There are currently two lawsuits that are addressing that. Uh, one is called Pena v. Sid, and that's a federal challenge. And it's currently pending, I believe, in the Ninth Circuit. We're just awaiting for a decision on that. And then the National Shooting Sports Foundation also has a state law complaint challenging the microstamping requirements for California's roster. Uh, to get updates on those, like I said, check out the NRA and CRPA California Legal Affairs Report. Uh, that includes most of the firearms litigation, as I said, as well as other issues that NRA and CRPA are handling here in California. Um, I see a couple more. Um, if you registered your firearm previously as an assault weapon, you do not re need to re-register it. Again, one of the things DOJ has says they will not do is register firearms that previously should have been registered. So if you have a, what's commonly referred to a Category 1, 2, or 3, the old version of Category 3, um, already registered to you, and be very careful of that because, like I mentioned before, the DROS process is not the assault weapon registration process. It's a separate thing. So if you have what you think to be a previously registered assault weapon, say it's a make model ban gun, or back when the detachable magazine ban um, assault weapons came into effect, if you register the firearm, you should have confirmation from DOJ that it was registered to you. If you do not, you might want to check the automated firearm system to see if that firearm is registered to you or contact an attorney because if you didn't get confirmation from DOJ that that firearm came back registered is now registered to you as an assault weapon, I have serious concerns because it's happened in the past. Uh, so bear that in mind. Um, oh, there was a good question about what happens when you pass away. Um, and you're the only registrant. Unfortunately for you, your family will have a very narrow period of time in order to either surrender that firearm to law enforcement, sell that firearm to a licensed firearm dealer with a dangerous weapons permit, or get that thing out of Dodge. And so they would be able to keep it, just not in California, if they aren't a joint registrant of the firearm. Um, some questions relating to removal of the um, the bullet button and what are the possible implications. Right now, I would assume that the removal of the bullet button would not only be potentially viewed as a violation of a California regulation, uh, which could be prosecuted as a misdemeanor, but I would assume DOJ in getting clever would try to say um, that that firearm is not the one quote unquote registered as an assault weapon. It would be open to discussion and argument. However, you're going to be doing that in the context of a full-blown felony case if DOJ 
is not too happy with you for removal of the bullet button. Again, that would remain to be seen. And what that situation is in the future, uh, not entirely clear. Of course, my advice, if you're going to go about the route of registration, don't remove the bullet button until something else is a little bit more clear with respect to the repercussions and, of course, any challenges with respect to the ability to do that. I'll jump in here, too. Uh, I see a couple questions regarding uh, whether or not there's a way to check uh, what firearms are currently registered to you, including if you have a firearm that's previously registered as an assault weapon. I'm going to post a link here in chat uh, that you can fill out a form and send that to the Department of Justice. Uh, it's called an Automated Firearm System Request for Firearm Records. Uh, submitting that form to the California Department of Justice should provide you with a uh, with information regarding what firearms are currently registered to you in your name, as well as any firearms that are classified as assault weapons under previous registration periods. So if you're unsure uh, if a firearm, for example, was previously registered as an assault weapon, that's a good resource that you can use to check to see if it actually was previously registered. Um, a couple of questions I'm seeing. If you've registered the firearm as an assault weapon pre-2000 and now you want to re-register it with the bullet button on it. Um, I, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you wanted to install a bullet button onto a previously registered assault weapon um, that would cause the firearm to meet the definition, it was lawfully possessed um, because you registered it as an assault weapon before, installing a bullet button on it kind of neither here nor there because it was possessed as an assault weapon, but yeah, if you wanted to register the firearm now as an assault weapon with a bullet button attached to it, you may. It's just I would have some concerns and you'd probably have a problem in removing the bullet button. Uh, kind of an odd question, so there's no great answer with respect to it. My question, of course, would be why would you want to register a previously registered assault weapon uh, when it comes to uh, the new bullet button ban? Um, questions with respect to the pictures. If you're going to take a picture of the firearm and then do the checks box uh, concerning the features attached to it, I would advise checking all the boxes uh, that you took the picture um, of the firearm and had those parts on, on it. Basically saying that if you take a picture of your rifle and it has a pistol grip um, and a forward pistol grip and say a flash suppressor attached to it, those are the boxes you check. Um, I could see DOJ coming back to you and saying, well, where's the pistol grip or where is something else if you check a box um, and you, but it doesn't pick that feet when you take the picture. Um, question concerning an 80% build. Unfortunately, yes, when it comes to the serial number requirement, uh, even if you've already gotten and have gone through the process previously that I have even mentioned before should have worked for purposes of the um, ghost gun registration process, um, DOJ is making it unfortunately rather clear that in order for you to register your firearm as an assault weapon, now, with, that was a previous 80% build, you need to get a serial number from them and have a, that number affixed to it. Um, again, it's an unfortunate distinction and one that uh, is not necessarily uh, that great as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let's just leave it at that. Um, but nevertheless, that appears to be the process, that if you want to register the firearm, and that you build up from an 80%, you still need to go through the um, serial number application process, have that number placed onto the firearm um, prior to registering as an assault weapon. I think we should probably call it there. Um, yeah. At that, that point, just, good to me. Ju just so you guys know, uh, this, of course, this webinar uh, has been recorded and will shortly be available on the California Rifle and Pistol Association's website. Uh, if you do have any more questions regarding this webinar, please send them to contact at crpa.org. We will do our best to answer those questions as we get them. Uh, but other than that, thank you for your time today. And of course, we look forward to future webinars with you guys. Absolutely. You guys take care. Have a good day.